before my eyes I can see. Oh, there's empty up and there's money left. They
Amén, aleluya. Gloria, gloria a Dios, aleluya. There's a city that looks o'er the valley of death, and its glory has ever been told. Where the Lamb is the light in the midst of the night, in that beautiful city of gold, where the sun
Amen. And bring him. Amen. And my family, Barbara needs prayer real bad. She's my daughter and I love her, but she don't go to church. And she's brought up in church. But uh, she needs prayer about that. And we, <coughs> something has come our way that I don't know hardly how to handle. But God does. Amen. To hold us up, hold my children up, my grandchildren up. I really appreciate it. Amen. Amen. If you will, get your Bibles out this morning. As I always say, there's some in the pews there too if you need one. Stand up if you're able to stand. Shake your Bible around. Let God see your Bible. And there's no dust coming off of these Bibles because we use oh, our Bibles. Praise God. And repeat after me with conviction, with our profession of faith. Amen. Our profession of faith. This is my Bible. This is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. This is the available Word of God. Jesus is the Word. It's the good news. The good report. The sound doctrine. This is what I believe in. Stand on. Live by and trust in. Thank you, Lord, for your only word. Amen. Thank you, sweet Jesus. We are waiting for a time when our Lord and Savior is going to return. And we know He's returning. He promised us that. And He's prepared a place for us. And one day He's going to come back for His own. And Sister Mary, I can't wait until I get in front of Heaven's <laughs> gate. And we'll see the master standing off coming near us. And we know that he's going to say these words. Come, good and faithful servant. But Brother Richard, there's going to be some that he's not going to say that. Amen. He's going to be standing there looking upon us. And he's going to say, you workers of iniquity. I knew you not. And then we're going to make our defense to him. Lord, didn't we do all these great things in your name? We had church. We took care of the young, the old. We fed people. People came to the altar and gave their lives for you. We did all these great things for you, Lord. People were healed, people were delivered. We don't stand there and say, no. You workers of iniquity, I knew you not. My message today is on seed, good seed and bad seed, and wheat and tares. I, I, I want to rest your spirit today. When we get into this subject, there's many people that sometimes they, they, they get a little frightened, they get a little worried. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'm not right with the Lord. Maybe, maybe something's going on. The message today, I want to put this disclaimer, is this. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've confessed Him with your mouth, if you've given Him your heart, because it's a heart condition. How many people understand? It's not your mouth, it's your heart. You've given Him your heart, you've given Him your life. And claimed Him as Lord and Savior, and you're following Him. You are saved. So I want to put that disclaimer right now. Sometimes people, people, we, the devil will play with your mind and tell you, Geneva, that you're not right. You're not saved. You, know, you don't have the goods anymore. You've lost your salvation. Well, I've come to tell you this. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you may doubt sometimes. You may get knocked down sometimes. But you know what? I'm going to stand on his holy word. Amen. And it says, if I'll confess, I'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. I'll be saved. And that confession is made not just with your mouth, but with your heart. Don't let the devil mess with your head. Don't let people mess with your head. But we need to speak a little bit today about tares and wheat and the differences itself. Today I want you to turn, if you will, praise God. We're going to turn to chapter 13 of the book of Matthew. Amen. Say amen when you're there. And I'm going to do a lot of reading today. We're going to talk about seed, good seed. You know, God himself starts out talking about 
seed, good seed, in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis and, and chapter 1. In fact, in chapter 1, 12, but we'll just turn there for a moment while we got our Bibles open up. Genesis 1, 12 says this. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, you're going to realize that God not just said things into existence, he saw that it was good. And Brother Barry, he said that seven times. Seven times is a great number in the Bible. Seven times. He saw that it was good. He saw that it was good. So we're going to be talking about seed a little bit. We're going to be talking about planting a little bit this morning. I preached before uh, 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 on chapter 13, the first part, but we're going to get into the tears coming up here in a bit. But let's go to 13.1 for a second. If everybody's there, Matthew 13.1. It says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the sea aside. And great multitudes were gathered unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And Jesus spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the way, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up, and because of no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no not root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprang up and choked them. That's what thorns do. That's what weeds do. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who have ears to hear, let them hear. I pray that right now. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that those that have ears to hear, let them hear today, Lord God, not just in their natural ears, but in their spiritual ears and their heart, Lord. Father, just bless them today with understanding of your word. Amen. 10 says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall it be taken away, even that, hath, that he hath. 13 says, Therefore spake, I go to them in parables. I speak to them in parables, because they sing, see not. Hearing they hear not, and neither do they understand. And in that is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear. And shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For the people's hearts is facts gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed. At least at any time they shall see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and shall understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them. To hear these things which you hear, and have not heard them. Hear therefore the parable of the sower. And 8.19 says, And when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it is not, then cometh the wicked one, and, and catches away. And that's what the devil does, he catches away that is sown in your heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. But he that receives seed into the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word, and that none with joy receiveth. And 21 says, Yet hath he not roots in himself, but doeth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches Choke the word, and it become unfruitful. 23 says, And he that received the word in good ground, is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. We're at 24, and between 24 and 43 is what I want to be studying on today. 
We're not just going to be talking about seed. We're going to be talking about seed that the enemy has planted himself. And 24 starts out, listen to this. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of God is likened to a man which soweth good seed in his field. I want you to say good seed. The seed. But while men slept, the enemy, I want you to say enemy. The enemy. While he slept, the enemy came to sow tares among the wheat and went his way. What is a tear? A tear is a weed that when it starts to grow, Brother Kevin, it looks just like the wheat. And we have to understand that this is from the enemy. You cannot tell wheat, and you almost have to be an expert to tell wheat from the tear. Now we know that, as we continue to read, that we're not to pull up the wheat for or, or pull up the tares, or at least we pull up the wheat. What happens, Sister Sandra, is that, they, that, that if you do some studying on this, is that the root process of the tear mingles with the good root of the wheat. They cannot be separated. Yes. They're tangled up. So yes. when you pull one up, you pull the other one up. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not until harvest time that you can actually tell the difference. The, 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 the wheat will be golden, green. It'll actually be a little higher than the tares, but the tares will be a, a, like a dark grayish to even a blackish color. And the problem with the tares is not just weeds, they're poisonous. But they can actually poison the wheat. And that's what they do. They poison and they kill the wheat that's there. But once it's harvest time, we can't just pluck them up. You have to take the tares out with the wheat, and it's harvest time, and you literally have to separate them manually. Listen to what I'm saying here. Because in other countries, and even in our own country, if the tares get into the wheat, it can actually poison the eat for human consumption. So you literally have to separate the two and pull them apart at the roots at times. So the tares are here, we're going to throw those away, and we got the wheat. But if you pull them up before it's harvest time, you can damage and kill not just the one, but the other two. You cannot separate them by pulling them up. It's not going to happen. But when it comes harvest time, there is a distinct difference. The wheat is up there. If you've ever seen wheat, if you've gone out on the farm country and it's blowing wind, you can just see the grain going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The tares are a little stiffer. They don't praise God, as I call it, praising God. They're just there. And you can see the difference. But unfortunately, if the weeds are already there, you have to let them grow. You have to let them grow up together here. So let's get back to the scriptures here, praise God. We're at back at 26, and it says, But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Now you can tell the difference a little bit, and here's what the servants say. So the servants of the householder came and said, Sir, that's not so good seed in the field. Didn't you sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath these tares? And he said unto them, An enemy, an enemy hath done this. An enemy has done this. The Bible says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10 10. But Jesus, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. The enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay. That means no. At least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both of them grow up together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barns. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in the field which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air can come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal, and the whole was leavened. Leaven means east. It means to rise. It means to grow, and that's what heaven is. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spoke not unto them. 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. What we're learning today, listen to this, is what's been kept from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and he came to the house to his disciples, and to them saying, Declare unto you the parable of the cares of the field. He's going to explain what's going on here. Listen to this. Jesus answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of God. He that soweth the good seed, Sister Geneva, is, is Jesus himself. The field, and I hear a lot of people preaching that the field is the church. I want you to notice it doesn't say church, it says what? World. World. It includes the church. The field is the entire world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The field is the world. That good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of what? The wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. Plain spoken here. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Praise God. As I was thinking upon this and praying to God, how do we present this today? There's three classifications, which you might call tears. One, we have to understand that if you are not a true believer of Jesus Christ, you are a non-believer, you are in fact a tear. So what's a tear? Someone that is not real, someone that is, is false. I want somebody, if you will, Brother Al, uh, turn your Bible to John 3. 3, 16, and read 16, 17, and 18. John 3, 18 is what I want to get to, but read, read this to the church this morning. All right, so you want me to start at where? John 3, 16. All right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent now his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he, he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. Those that do not believe are what? Condemned already. What saves is belief in Jesus Christ. But here's, here's where I'm getting at. Here's what the see. We go to church, and I was one of these people. When I was a kid, I told you we didn't go to church much, but the few times we went to church, and I remember one time they had asked us in, in school, and they used to ask, what religion are you? And I didn't know. And I went home and I asked my mom, and I said, Mom, and this was before she was a member of the church, I said, Mom, what religion are we? And she goes, uh, well, we go to a Christian church. I said, we're Christians. And because we went to church once in a while, I came back to school and says, I'm a Christian. But I soon found out about 37, 40 years later, because you go to church doesn't make us a Christian. Because we have a mother or a father or a grandfather, grandmother, that's a Christian doesn't mean that we're a Christian. Because we sing and we play music or maybe even preach or teach or, or do Sunday school or we've been baptized doesn't make us a Christian. It's not... Your mouth. The Bible says, you know, Jesus said this in something was quoting from the Old Testament. He says, These people honor me with their mouths, but their heart is far from it. We have to give our heart to him totally. So so the thing is when we when we come to church and, and when we profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it, it, it's not mouth service, it's got to be heart service. Why are we doing this? So if we're doing it with a sincere heart, 
if you made a commitment to Christ, and notice I said the word commitment, that we made a commitment to Jesus Christ, we, we, we were sold out to Him, He's our Lord, He's our Savior, then you're saved. But if we go to church, and I went to a, a church period of time, when I first started, I told you the story many a time, I was hoping, Sister Rose, some of that would rub off on me. Maybe if I'm next to Brother Barry a little bit, or maybe if I'm like next to Brother Richard, maybe some of that Jesus stuff will right, rub off on me itself. Well, it didn't rub off on me. I got it myself. But the point I'm getting at is that if that's the reason to come to church, that's okay. At least you're trying. At least you're there to hear the gospel preach. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. But there's many people in church today that come up and make a profession of faith, a confession of faith, and they want to believe. Many people then later will get baptized. But yet, their hearts are far from it. Their hearts are far from it. The Bible says not to examine our brother or sister, but to examine who? Yourself. Ourselves. To see if we're the faith. So sometimes we have to look, and I have to do this all the time myself. Am I doing, Father, what you want me to do? Am I doing the will of the Father? Am I doing what you want? Are you pleased with what I'm saying? Are you pleased with what I'm doing? Are you pleased in my lifestyle? And if your lifestyle isn't lining up with what God wants, if your actions isn't lining up with what God wants, if your words aren't lining up with what God wants, oh, Lord, I've, I've fallen on this trap myself as a youngster coming into church. Now, when I say youngster, I'm talking about in my early 40s where our lifestyle doesn't line up. And we have to start making a true confession to ourselves. Lord, forgive me because I'm not doing the will of you. I'm not doing what you want me to do. I'm not acting as a Christian should act. It's easy to be in church and, and raise up holy hands. It's easy to say the right things. We know we're not supposed to cuss and swear. And here, Sister Sandra, this is church, right? <laughs> we, get out, we get out on the streets. We go to work. We, we, we go to the store and all that. We become a different person at times. Or if I'm around the sisters here, I'm going to, I'm going to have one attitude towards her and, and another attitude towards them. And if I went to visit Brother Barry and Sister Joyce, I'm going to talk very godly. But how am I talking outside the home? What am I doing outside the home? Is God pleased with what he's hearing? Is God pleased with what he's seeing? And we have to ask ourselves that question. Does that mean we have to be perfect? None of us is perfect in here. And I get on this theme a lot. Listen to what I'm saying today. But we strive to perfection. We strive to perfection. Lord, help me. Help me serve you. Help me say the right things. Help me do the right thing. Help me teach the right things. Help me do what you want me to do. Let me do your will. Not to go through the motions. Because if people follow us around... They look like we're doing a good job for the Lord, but let, it, let our heart, our true intent of the heart, is our heart honoring Him. So one type of terror is a person that fakes it. There used to be an old saying in our business, fake it until you make it. I guess we've all faked it a little bit. Sometimes we don't feel good, we fake it. I'm blessed. But I believe that if we're truly God's people, we can call those things or as honest as they were. Amen. But then there's a, another type of tear. And this is a deceived deceiver. I call them DDs, and you've heard this before. What's a DD? It means deceived deceiver. They believe because they made that profession of faith, because someone has told them to do that or to go up and do that they're saved. They believe that. And I've seen people in church services, and you have too, where they'll take somebody, hey, let's go up, let's go up and get prayed for. Give your life to the Lord. I've seen that in churches. Or they'll pray, let's go up and, and God will heal you. Let's go up. You know what? God called everybody up. Uh, he doesn't want to force you up. If you have to be forced up for your salvation, you have to be forced up for your deliverance, that's not true deliverance. That's not true salvation. He wants you to come willingness. He wants you to receive him willingly. Amen. So we go up and we give what we think our heart to the Lord, and it's not a sincere heart. I heard a story of 
sister told me one time about a person that had gotten married and and within hours after the marriage, the woman was sleeping with the best man or somebody from the wedding later. Now, I heard that. Now, let me tell you something. That person might have been married on a piece of paper, but were they married with their heart? No. Were they married with their conviction? Not at all. No. Not at all. So anybody can have a piece of paper. Anybody can, they, they can they go through the motion. We might, we might have a, a legal marriage, but is it, a, is it a marriage through the heart? And when you receive Jesus Christ, it's got to be through your heart. It doesn't matter if you have a piece of paper that says you're baptized. It doesn't matter even if you're a minister with a piece of paper on the wall that says you're a preacher or a pastor or what have you. If your heart's not in it, you're not, tr you're not truly that person. That's right. But you That's deceive right. yourself. And we were deceived. And, 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 and then we think that everything's fine. And you know what? We can do mighty things for God in His name. There's power in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Someone says, well, a sinner man can never do any good. If he's deceived, he's a sinner, so how, how, how could he do good in the church? The Reverend Billy Graham gave his life to the Lord at the age of 17, and his pastor was a backslidden pastor. There's another man by the name of Judas. We've all heard of him. You know, Judas went out with others and the church. Judas prayed for people, and brother, our people were healed. He went out with the 12. He went out with the 70. Judas was walking along all alone, doing God's work, and things were happening. Amazing things were happening. But Judas had a problem. He had a heart condition. I'm not talking about a bad heart where he's going to take a heart attack. He had a spiritual heart condition in a bad way. And we know that for 30 pieces of silver, he led the guards in the, of the priest to Jesus to have him arrested. He's what I would call a, a DD, a deceived deceiver. I think he deceived himself because there was power when he prayed. There was power among the other Christians. Sometimes we may not have any power to speak of but because we're with somebody else that does have the power, that does have the good. Things happen. I preached on the other night about when God blesses you and you're around other people, guess what? They get blessed. It's like an osmosis type of effect. It touches everything around. So when we're preaching the word of God and we're laying hands on people and you're there, you can feel God's presence. You can feel the anointing of God. But there's a big difference sometimes when you're all out there by yourself ministering or preaching. We deceive ourselves thinking everything is right. And that scripture I quoted earlier, when you're standing in front of God, and, and God says, you workers of iniquity, and you're not, he says, Lord, Lord, that wasn't to the sinner man or woman that knows he's a sinner man or woman. That's to the church of God that believes that they are truly saved in his, and they aren't. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing to be in? A situation? Lord, we did all these great things. I did all these great things for you. And to see his eyes meet mine. And say, you workers of iniquity, or in my case, you workers of iniquity, I knew you not. Reminds me of the story about the ten virgins. God closed the door. When he closed the door, guess what? It was closed. I said, Lord, we're here. Husband, we're here. You workers of iniquity, I knew you not. And then you have some tares that are, Brother Richard, how say shit? They're in the church, planted by the enemy to cause trouble, to cause division, to cause divisiveness, to cause stress. See, the Bible says we're going to be known by our fruit. The fruit of God is love, joy, peace, long suffering, forgiveness. But there's another side of that coin, if we read the scripture above that, in the fifth chapter of, 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 of Galatians, and it says that those that are causing strife, those are gospelers, those that are talking, those are causing division. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. Well, how shall I say it's a fruit of the Spirit, but it's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So we've all got into that a little bit. We let the other Spirit influence at times. That doesn't mean we're lost. But see, 
Here's why God is waiting to come back. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. And the reason why he told the angels, the reapers, not to pull the tares up now, let them grow up together in the church. Let them grow up together in the church. We'll separate them later at harvest time. The reason for that, he wants every week to be saved, but he's also giving the tares to change. Here's what's good about God. It doesn't matter if we have a rotten attitude or an unholy attitude, whether we're faking it to try to make it, or whether we're fakes to get, begin with, whether we want to just be part of a church because we can tell people we're a Christian. It doesn't matter. What matters is this. If we're in the we're a house of God enough, maybe we'll hear something one day that'll prick our heart, and that tear can change into not no longer a tear but a wheat. The Word of God tells me that He doesn't want anybody to be lost. No man, no woman, no child to be lost. But I pray that we can say something one day or, or encourage somebody one day that they start to realize, you know, what I'm doing isn't quite right. What I'm doing is playing church. I need to quit playing church. I need to totally be the church of the living God. I need to totally surrender myself to the living God. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but you're on your way. Because God makes us perfect through His righteousness, praise God, not ours. But we pray and pray and pray that there'll come a time that the tares no longer will be tares. They'll be wheat waiting and growing themselves with golden grain to give God glory one day. Hallelujah. I heard a preacher preach one time, if you have a, the spirit of a tear in you, you'll never change. Contraire. Contraire. I know people that have been the most hideous people in church, but they changed and are now good Christians. I know people that faked it for years. But one day, truly gave their heart to God, and they're now God's people. God. See, nothing is impossible with God. If we say it, why don't we believe it? Nothing is impossible with God. That man or that woman that is in church, maybe they're sitting next to you right now, and, 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 and you know what? Maybe they're not doing the right thing. Maybe they are tears. Maybe they're, they're, they're doing unholy things. But you know what? I can pray for that person as a pastor and as a Christian. That's what we need to do is to pick up our sick, to pick up our wounded, to pick those that aren't even ours, not even God's yet, and say, God, I want to pray for the enemy because the enemy is the ones that aren't saved. The enemy is the ones that are lost. I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to go after that one sheep. I'm going to go after the lost because I want them to be found. I want them to, be, I want them to, to have a new life, a new beginning like me. And God can, if the person comes to them willingly, if they come to receive Him willingly, if they come to accept Him as Lord and Savior. Yes. Hallelujah. Some of us have children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, mm -hmm. maybe a friend. that we thought would never be saved. They could have the most despicable lives. They could even be in church in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. We're not to judge, but I know if a person is living like the devil one week and in church the next week, living like the devil one week, living like they're not truly repentant. They're not truly saved. They're not truly delivered. I don't need to point that out. I believe that person knows that already deep down in their heart. They already know it. But I can pray that one day, one day they'll get complete deliverance. One day they'll get complete salvation. One day they'll know who the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings truly is. Not by namesake, but by a relationship. One day. Never, never give up, and I keep repeating that. Mm -hmm. Never give up your prayers and your loved ones. Never give up prayers on the ones that are lost. That's right. Sister Mary said something the other week, and it's something we've said in here before too. She said sometimes the people with the worst past end up becoming the greatest Christians. Yes, that's right. The people that are despicable, that are ugly, that we don't even want to be around with, that we wouldn't even associate with now. They become the greatest Christians because they've been forgiven so much. Amen. And God has a job for them. When someone says, you don't know. You don't know what I've done. Because I've been the drug user. I've been the drunk. I've been the adulterer. I've been the liar. I've been the thief. I've been there. You? Yes, me. How did you change? You already know the answer to that. 
I got a man named Jesus. I got a man named Jesus. It's time for the church to get serious. It's time for the ones that are DDs, deceived deceivers, not to be deceived anymore and wake up and say, wait a minute, my life doesn't match up with the Bible. I'm not doing God's will. I'm doing things against his will. And it bothers me a little bit, but not enough to quit. Hmm, what's wrong with this picture? Maybe I ought to get back on my knees. Maybe I ought to start surrendering everything to him. And the ones that are just pretending like it's a club, I'm going to tell you what. Evidently, you don't believe the Bible, because if you believe the Bible, you'd have the fear of God, and you know that when he comes back, guess what? You're not going to enter the heaven's gate. There's goats and there's sheep, but here's the that's great thing. they got a big old door up there that says sheep, and, and all the sheep are just walking in. They're walking right by the Lord and Judgment Day, and they're all going that way. And then the goats are going to come up and go, Ah, Lord, we did all these great things in your name. We're ready to go in. Wait a minute. Let's see your badge. Let's see, does it say goat or sheep? It says goat. Wait a minute. you got to go over here. Well, I don't want to go over there. That looks like a bad place. Yep, yep. What can I say? And no argument that we can make is going to get us in that door. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We need to bow right now while we're alive on this side of the realm. Because when we're in front of him on Judgment Day, we will be bowing. But guess what? He's not going to hear. You workers of iniquity, I knew you not. So, in church, going back to the tares and the wheat, and this used to bother me as a young Christian, Brother Perry, I, I see, I almost got myself in trouble a few times. I almost sat down uh, a couple times by the elders of the church where I'd see wrong, and I'd want to point out wrong and say, this person has all these followers and they're they're praising and honoring this person but they have a different lifestyle behind the door closed doors and i was told to shut up yeah. in those words leave them be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. leave them be yeah and they took me to the parable of the tears and the wheat they said you know what if you pull up that person out of church that's going to affect the ones that are not mature that's going to affect the new faith in Christ. That's going to affect them to the point that they're going to say, hey, this was our idol when they've been torn out. Now, this is my idol. And, and if, they, if they're doing something they ought not to be doing, how am I ever going to make it into God's kingdom? And when you come against a child of God, if he's done something wrong, he still could be right. But if he's not a child of God, you come against him, it stirs up animosity, it stirs up division. In the church. That's why we don't pull people up. I had a gentleman about five years ago, we got done with a nursing home. And we came out, and he doesn't come to our church, but he proceeded to tell me in front of people from another church, and the other people just rolled their eyes and shook their head, what he's saying is wrong. Saying, if I was you, Pastor, I wouldn't have this person in church, this person in church. That person in church, I would tell him to leave the church. Mm -hmm. And forward to my witness, said, well, thank God you're not the pastor. Thank God you're not the pastor. Because whenever we point a finger, there's three pointed back. Yeah. Uh -huh. When we think that we have all the goods yeah. and we're perfect, guess what? Yeah. None of us are above anybody else. Amen. Sister Rose may have a different understanding than Brother Richard. Rich, Brother Richard may have a different understanding than Brother Kevin. We're all disciples of Christ, us that are saved and sealed. We're just sometimes at different levels of understanding, different levels of maturity. So I want to mature in the Lord. I want to say, Lord, I'm not doing everything perfect right now, but man, I strive to perfection. Teach me, guide me through your Holy Ghost. Man, I have an ear to hear. We have to have a willingness to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying to us, what the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead and guide you in all truth. He'll take you to the right direction. But have that willingness to, to be led. And if you have that willingness to be led, he'll lead you. So the disclaimer that we started with is that 
if you truly have accepted him as Lord and Savior, you are not a tear. You are a child of God. You're a saint of God. Are you going to be perfect? No. Do you strive for perfection? Yes. We want to do his will. His will. Will you fall sometimes and slip? Yes. Do you get back up and serve him? Yes. We go on. <laughs> but today, as we close out here, I want us to stand here in a moment as we stand. I want us to ask God to guide our lives. Not your brother's or sister's life, but your life. And ask God if there's anything in you that should not be there. Such as hatred, unforgiveness. Pridefulness. Anything that is not becoming of God. Slander, talking about one another. Bad attitudes. Let that becoming of a Christian. Let's ask God to renew that. Brother Richard, I had to do that three weeks with myself. I'm going to do it again today. Paul said he crucified his flesh when? Daily. Daily. Let's not just do it on Sunday. Let's do it every day. Take this anger that's in me out. Take this unforgiveness that's in here out. Take this slander that's in me out. Take this. Take whatever impurities that I have out. Sister Geneva's preached a few times on, on, on the, the Lord uh, putting on the potter's will. We, we, have, we should have a willingness to want to be put on the potter's will to say, Lord, take the blemishes out. I want to be more like you. Because until we get to a point of, of changing where people can see a big change, we're no different than the world. God wants you to be the wheat waving in the wind and praising God. He doesn't want you to be a terror. He doesn't want you to be a phony. He doesn't want you to be a fake. He wants you to be the genuine article. Amen. And be honest enough with him and say, God, I'm not perfect. You're the only one that's perfect. But Lord, I have your righteousness because of not of me, because of you. That's the only reason why I'm getting into heaven's gate. So I praise you for that. I'm thankful for that. But Lord, in the meantime, while I'm here on this earth, sanctify me, Lord. Help me. Help me get to a point where, where I, I can walk a holier life. You said to be holy for you're holy. I want to be holy. I don't want to be holier than thou. I want to be holier for you. I give myself to you today. Will you all stand with me this morning?